roll. Wow. <laughs> going, Julie. Hello, welcome to the Yuki D and Jinx show number four, and we have some amazing, uh, amazing rock and roll stereo guests today. So Julie, why don't you tell everybody where we're recording from today and who our guests are and other announcements. Oh yeah, absolutely. So we are recording live from the Palace Theater and Art Bar here in sunny Georgetown, Seattle. Uh, as we do every first Tuesday of the month mm -hmm. from 8 to 8.45, although tonight is may a special run. night. Yeah, it may run, run a little late. A little late. Um, so uh, before we get going with our, our amazing guests, which I will introduce in just a moment, uh, I just want to uh, run through a few announcements. Uh, first with our uh, esteemed uh, sponsorship, The Stranger. I want to let everyone know that The Stranger uh, which, of course, is Seattle's only premier magazine, I think. Uh, they're having their first annual stoner film festival called Spliff, uh, and it's happening wow. April 19th and 20th at the Egyptian, Egyptian Theater in Capitol Hill. Uh, tickets are available while they last over at www.strangertickets.com. Uh, you can also pick up The Stranger's Pet Issue plus The Green Guide uh, next Wednesday, April 10th. It'll be available in hard copy at various establishments all around Seattle. Um, I also want to mention uh, there's a Stranger giveaway uh, for the UKD and Jinx show uh, for a table and complimentary drinks that we have every month. Um, over at the uh, stranger.com slash promotions. It's called the Stranger Giveaway. Uh, and all you got to do is enter. It's just like a, any kind of a giveaway. You enter and you get your and own And you table, get some free drinks. And you get some free drinks. And you get to hang out with us. Uh, this year we got uh, Ivan and his plus one. So congrats, Ivan, for coming on down. Um, I also want to let everyone know that next month uh, we will be filming again here uh, May 7th with casts from the iconic Seattle sketch uh, show called Almost, Almost Live. Live. Yeah. Which I don't know if everyone, everyone should remember this show. It was amazing. Uh, so we will be having cast members coming, visiting with us, and reminiscing. Uh, that will be next Tuesday, May 7th, here at the Palace. Um, Finally, two more things. Uh, Brian and I, as you guys may or may not know, Brian and I met years ago as Magic the Gathering vintage artists mm -hmm. for the game. First 49. Yep, for Magic the Gathering trading card game. Uh, and Bellingham, we, right? We met in Bellingham. We met in Bellingham, yes. yes. Absolutely. God, you're good. Listen to the memory on this Holy guy. Cow. Forget about it. Um, anyway, <laughs> we're going to be making an appearance uh, over at the Puget Sound Battleground. Yes. That's in Tacoma, May 4. Yes. It's uh, hosted by the Geek Fortress, uh, Geek Fortress Games guys, and there are tickets available at www.geekfortressgames.com. And it'll be us and a few other of the Vintage Magic Several artists. Several other Vintage Magic uh, artists. Including uh, Anson Maddox, which yes. is flying out from um, where he lives out, I think, in Nevada. He, li he lives in Nevada now. Yep. yep. Uh, finally, I want to bring this up. This is really important to me, as you all know, with the name Jinx. Uh, my nickname Jinx comes from the fact that I used to play roller derby. I'm one of the founders of Rat City Roller Girls. Mm -hmm. uh, and this week, it was announced that they are losing their practice space. Oh, that's a horror uh, show. It was yeah. sold. Um, the Rat's Nest was sold. Uh, and they will be kicked out, including the uh, junior derby leagues are getting kicked out. Uh, the end of May, I believe. Hey, and Seattle's they, going to hell because the Art Institute shut down just a few weeks ago, I know. too. It sucks. Um, so, it did, right? yeah. yeah. And we want to let everyone know about this because the uh, Rat City Roller Girls, who are now called Rat City Roller Derby, uh, are looking for a new venue and are asking everyone in Seattle if they know of a space, a location where they can lay out their track and have not only the Rat City Roller Derby Girls skate and play, but also the junior leagues, which they're little little girls, little kids uh, learning how to skate, uh, who will no longer have a, a place to play as well. Um, anyway, they're looking for uh, help. And so if anyone knows of a space or has uh, access to uh, real estate, warehouse, 
anything. Uh, please contact them. You can check them out over at www.ratcityrollergirls.com. Uh, they do have contact information there where you can get in, in okay. touch with them. That's All right, a lot Julie. Of space, huh? Yeah, That's a lot of space they're going to need. Yeah, yeah, they are. They do need a, a decent amount of space for their track. But that's all they need. I mean, all they need is a space for a track at this point. Um, and uh, so they're looking for some help. And of course, me being a, one of the founders, it's been 15 years. Yeah. I feel like got to put gotta throw out there. Sure. Got to throw them a bone. Now, Julie, everybody is vibrating in their chair right I now because they want you to introduce the guest, OK? So, so we I got to rein you in like the lion tamer I that know, I am. I know, I know. OK. I like listening to a tour. So do I. I think we should, I think we should just just discuss <laughs> possibilities of where they could go. Yeah. I know. Well, I Olympia, wanted, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Well, no, ah. Olympia has the, the only rollers are down in Olympia. Okay. I think they're still around. Um, and Bellingham, I think, still has a leak as well. Maybe we should scare the hell out of Bellevue. Bellevue does not have a leak. That's right. I don't know. Um, but I do want to introduce our two guests. And we have two rock and roll, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but you both are rock and roll Hall of Famers, correct? I am. Are you? <laughs> no, that. <laughs> two this is going to be really good. I know, I know, I know, didn't know, know that. Strap your seatbelts on. So yeah. two rock I, I and roll I don't Hall keep track. Two, two years ago. Two years ago, oh. And it took us 45 years to get there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it always, it does, you know. Well, you got there. <laughs> yeah. You got there. And I uh, got two Rock and Roll Hall of Famers, both drummers, both the same age, as I recall. Correct? Mm -hmm. Who's older? Yeah, I guess we're right in the area. Yeah, yeah I think we're kind of around the same. I'm, I'm, I'm 69. You're 69? I am 69, yeah. I'm 69. Okay, okay. both the same age. Came up the ranks. But yeah. you're 70 in about uh, six weeks. So I want to introduce both y'all. This is Alan White, Michael Hello. Street. Hello. Thank you Hello. guys for coming. Hello. I really Hello appreciate there. it. Um, Alan, as we know, uh, has been the drummer for Yes for many, many years. Correct? 47. 47, 47 years. years. That's all? Damn. In July, 47. 47. Wow. You also played with um, the Plastic Ono Band. And I know you've played with a variety of other people as well. Joe Coker. Joe Coker, oh, yes, sir. Um, cool. Terry Reed. Terry Reed. Terry Reed, George one Harrison. of the great Terry. singers. Did you, did you uh, George Harrison, correct, right? You both played for George Harrison, actually, didn't you? Well, he did an album. I Terry. did All Things Must Pass. All right. Things yeah, Must Pass. I did a track. Um, that was on a soundtrack that Dave Edmonds was producing ah. of a, an unbelievably great film called Porky's Last Revenge. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait to hear but it. Dave, but, but Dave Edmonds was producing, and Dave knows everybody. And, uh, and we were doing a tune, and George, George was going to sing it, uh, but he brought in with him the great studio drummer Jim Keltner. Oh, who uh, has played with every Beatle and and that group they had with Tom Petty? What was that group called? You know, whatever. Um, anyway, Jim is a great guy and an unbelievable drummer. And 20 years ago, I mean, this was in the 80s, but 10, maybe even 10, 15 years earlier, I would have, as George Harrison walked in with Jim Keltner, mm -hmm. I would have said, "Oh, of course, Jim, here." Take the sticks. Right. I was a little older and wiser by that time, and I said to myself, "No way, dude. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna play on a track with George Harrison. Hey. And if they say Good they don't you. like it, then you got Jim over there. But anyway, it so was, it was like, like a dual thing. That, like the, the, the drummers like throw a stick on the ground, and if the other guy picks it up, you gotta go it's like at Rochelle it. Or yeah. like or or yeah. Jim was a wonderful character. Yeah, he, he was uh, really quiet. Never like a mouse, but he was the one guy, he, I played with him with Joe Cocker. Mm. Really? Two drummers? He, he taught me how to play with two drummers in a band. Really? Which, he taught me to be forgiving. One guy can't play over the other guy yeah. and take, you know, all this kind of stuff. And we got to be huge friends. When he spent four months on a bus in Europe, 
with Joe Coco and talking on a daily basis, you know. Um, we became great friends, and he's still one of my good friends today when I see him, but he's, he's kind of taking the, the low, low side of life right now. Mm. Where, where does he live now? L.A. He's, he he's, lives in L.A. He's, you know, one of the most well-known and well-regarded studio drummers studio in, in drum. the world. Is he still working? Yeah, he still works. I mean, he, he's just um, a groove guy. And a feel exactly. guy, just yeah. very deep, and all the Beatles love him. Like Steve Gadd, you know, like Steve Gadd, sure. They just knew how to lay it down, lay the pocket down, and do what is necessary. Mm. So, I mean, him walking in with George Harrison, um, you know, I, I realized that um, the right thing to do would be because why did George bring Jim Keltner? You know. <laughs> But I, I just I pushed a little bit and I and we got it done and they and they loved it. So at least I can say I got a track with George Harrison playing this Bob Dylan song. What's it called? It's called I Don't Wanna Do It. It's called I Don't Wanna Do mm. It. Yeah. And I actually didn't get a chance to fully introduce you, Michael. Oh, yes. Michael Shreve. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, of course, uh, early years, I was first four or five years of Santana. You were yeah, yeah. on board. Uh, you also played with, uh, you played with Doe, Rolling Stones. You played with, you played with everybody. I mean, you, you really have. Uh, and and you play locally. I think you play a, a I was I was playing locally for years in Fremont okay. with mm -hmm. my band Spellbinder. That's right. That's I right. remember that. Name. Yeah, so we played wow. for for every Monday at Toast in Fremont for, um, and then it changed, and we played there as well, and we played Highway 99. We played around the area a lot, and then I just stopped. All of a sudden, I just got tired of it. You know, 50 bucks and uh, the same people, and you know. I don't know. I, I, I got an attitude. I saw you there. I have, yeah. I have a right. thing that when you start looking at the audience and you're not happy, time to stop, you know? Right. It's not a good attitude to be in. It's not a good frame of mind. And so, That's and right. I haven't done anything with the band in, in a year as I um, am, you know, in the forest trying to find myself. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm definitely going through a midlife crisis and, uh, and I'm, I'm, researching a lot of uh, software and electronic stuff and things that will help me move forward musically as I get older. Mm. Well, weren't you working on a, I thought you have been working on an album. Forever, almost. yeah. Okay, mm. so you're still working on it? Uh, it's done, and oh. I'm just working on the artwork. It's, oh, it's awesome. a It's a record called Drums of Compassion, and it is um, really a, a, a concept I came up with 20 years ago, where I used to go out all the time, even with kids, when they went to bed and go hear music, go look at music, like the old, um, that place in Roosevelt, um, Scarlet Tree. Anybody know oh, yeah. Scarlet Tree? That was so great. And um, and I came home one night at about two in the morning and I said, what kind of music? Because when I come home, I listen to chill music, really mm -hmm. chill. And it could be anything from. Oh yeah, you, you actually played with Steve Roach, speaking of Yes, that. right. Okay, yeah, that was yeah. one of the other ones. I'm a fan of, you know, kind of atmospheric music and mm -hmm. ambient and, and stuff like that. So I thought, what kind of music could I make as a drummer that I would want to listen to now at two in the morning? And so I started putting this concept together and I, I, I got a, a great local guy named Jeff Grinke, who's ambient, <clears throat> very special guy. And um, I played 16 toms standing up in a semicircles. So the thing was, it wasn't about groove, it was about space. Anyway. Um, 16, I, that takes up a lot of space. I mean. The, semi-circle, you know, you can. You yeah, know. How big was that? Uh, well, you know, it was pretty big. <laughs> but it, I'm not sitting down, I'm standing up. Okay. So it's not like a kit like Terry Bozio okay. or something. It, it's a different thing. Anyway, I eventually put on, added some of the great percussionists like Ayrto Moriera. Zakir Hussein, who played last night here in town, Jack D. Jeanette, um, Ola Tunji. So it's a very special record to me. And I can't explain the reason for my procrastination of not putting it out. But I'll be really honest here because, you know, everybody wants to know this, of course. I was uh, 
talking with a shrink um, uh, about eight months ago, and I was talking through this thing. And as I talked through it, I, I had my answer. Why am I not putting this out? And I should preface it with saying that I had sent this record out to a lot of my friends, you know, not a lot, but a selected few, and I never heard back from any of them. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah, so I was like, what the fuck, you know? <laughs> what is this? I mean, exactly. like, at least they can, like, fake it, you know? Right. And it, it's, gr it's great stuff, maybe not their stuff. A thank you would be nice. You know, just thanks for sending <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. Haven't had a chance to listen to it yet, yeah, you know? I but I'm going to get offer. to it, yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. At oh, any yeah, rate, we... so I, what I realized was this record is really important to me, and I think a lot of musicians go through this, so that's partly why I'm saying it. It's really important to me, and once I put it out, you know, nobody really cares, you know what I mean? That, that's the no, way it is, unless it's, it's a hit you record. Know, you know, the one satisfaction is it's special to you. It's spe and so, anyway, the artwork is beautiful, um, and uh, it's coming out very soon. But, good. you know, I guess I had now, to... Now, how many, how many songs do you have on that album? They're long, so... Um, uh -huh. uh, probably six. Six? Yeah. So it really is like a Steve it's, Rose it's type in, It's thing. instrumental. Yeah, yeah. And it's getting close to Yes records, like <laughs> yeah. two. Yeah, yeah, two, yeah. But each one lasts 45 minutes. I go for the 16-minute things, you know. Anyway. Well, let us know when it comes out. Yeah. We'll, we'll let people know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, we'll I'm, I'm actually pretty excited. I actually love ambient music, you know, big Brian Eno fan, of course. You know. mm -hmm. And Roger Eno as well. His, his yeah, really his brother. Awesome. Um, so let us know when it comes out. Yes, please. So, now one of the things I do know about both of you is you both uh, started out around the same time, 1969, I think. Uh, I mean, you guys have been playing longer than that, but we really got your big breaks. I know you got your your big break. Uh, I think uh, Woodstock. You were the youngest, mm -hmm. youngest, and it's the 50th anniversary of Woodstock this yes. year. Yes. But you were the youngest musician playing Woodstock, correct? Yeah. Well, actually. That's that's the the um, that's what everybody says. But the truth is, there was a guy in Shanana who was a little younger than me, oh, really? and he lets me know every time I see him. Oh. But I was younger. And it's like, man, I didn't start the rumor, you know. But I had just turned twenty. A month, uh, my birthday's July, and it was in August, so, you know. But I looked like I was 16. That was part of the thing that, you know. You like yeah, you looked like, like a kid. Like a I saw kid. that picture. Well, I was Amazing. a kid, really. You still look like you're 16. <laughs> yeah. Come on. So, and, you, and, uh, and you got that call, and you also got a call what, for, uh, from uh, around the time from uh, Lennon, correct? And you thought oh, it was yeah, a, yeah. a joke? That. I thought you knew about that. Yeah, oh, I knew about that. <laughs> no. Um, well, I didn't tell the story. Please. Oh, God. Uh, well, I just came from a Beatle Fest in New York. That's right. Yeah, you just came and, back. And uh, I'm still on New York time right now, but it's, you know, wonderful that I, I need some rest, and this is good rest right here. But um, I, it was wonderful, you know, and I, I, I got a call from Lennon, and um, he asked me, he said, I saw you playing in a club the other night, and uh, and he said, I think you'd be right, I've got a gig to do tomorrow <laughs> in Tor Toronto. No pressure. Yeah. No pressure, and I was cooking a stew for my band, and we were kind of a little bit hungry, and we were living on baked beans and selling records to stay alive, you know, the occasional gig, and we get money. and. Um, I dropped the phone because I said, you're not John Lennon. I said, come on, it's silly. It was like a Sunday morning or something ridiculous. I was cooking a stew, a beef stew, and uh, to keep everybody alive for a few days. <laughs> and um, and um, I put the phone down. I said, come on, you're joking with me. I thought it was a friend doing that. And then, um, then uh, rang again, I picked up the phone, and he said, no, this is John, this is me. He said, um, I need to do it, and that's when I had to sit down and, you know, drop tools, and he said, I'm doing a show, I'll send the car for you tomorrow. And um, 
maybe at the airport, and we got a gig to do tomorrow night in Toronto, Canada, and now we had, we got a show oh, tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> Meet yeah. you at the airport. Yeah. So, I'll, see you, you know, I'll see you in 25 uh, minutes. <laughs> it's, it's basically quite a lot in my career. It's been like jumping in the deep end and going, okay, I can do this, I think. But I was only 20 years old, That's so the I, deep thought, end, boy. I thought I'd just take the bull by the horns and get yeah. on with it. Yeah. And it, funnily enough, yeah. I never got nervous. I was quite naive and going, I guess this is what happens in the music business. You know, this is how it happens. Yeah, it's supposed to, everybody knows that, right? Yeah. Yeah. You, you get that call. You, call. you, you get that call. Goes, hey, yeah. That's why everybody. I ended up going to the airport and then uh, meeting John and Yoko and Klaus Room, and then then the door opened from the bathroom, and out walks a clap, and he said, I forgot to tell you, I explained it to him. I went, Woo. (laughs) This is big stuff, you know. No pressure here. And that's when Eric was God, right? Yeah, Yeah. I mean, he's, he's, I love Eric, he's one of the greatest guys. And uh, we got on the plane, rehearsed on the plane, pair of drumsticks on the back of a seat, and uh, Amazing. got there. And I remember that, um, G- you know, Gene Vincent was hanging around, and, oh, awesome. uh, and little Richard was playing on stage with a big band, and I'm going, really? oh my God, this is 25,000 people were in. Wow. Now, all these. American classic artists that you've listened to I just all your get life. Trust in the middle of all yeah. this, and being twenty and naive, I went, "Oh, this is okay." And it, you know, I I didn't really think anything at the time, and um, and I I was then okay. Get up and so time to go on, guys. We climbed the steps, got on stage. There was a drum stool, and I sat on the drum stool. And there was no drums. <laughs> and I, I see a flaw. And I was going, <laughs> what's going on? There's Minor no details. Yeah. And John and Eric, they were all tuning in the guitars and all that. And uh, they built a drum kit around me. And then I just grabbed my sticks. And then John said, one, two, three, four. And that was it. <laughs> and you were on? <laughs> no wow. pressure. No pressure. Uh, no pressure, but <laughs> funnily enough, we got most things right. There's a couple of goose, but and then I remember Eric looking at me, going, and, and looking at the floor, and I was going, "Where's Yorko?" She was in a bag on the floor, going. Aah! <laughs> and uh, Look, so what was there? What was Eric looking at? Like, yeah, do the, do the Eric look. <laughs> this is an experience here. Do you? So uh, it was, you know. And then all of a sudden, we finished the show. Everybody went crazy and walk off stage. Yoko's in a bag. <laughs> and, Come on. I asked him to do it again. He asked By the way, after that, I made a whole, I made a whole solo album called Fly with Yoko. Really? And was um, in bag John was time? playing, yeah. and she was in the she bag. She was in the bag all the time. And, and we were doing, we were running through a track. John had the leg going, and Klaus was there, we were just doing the whole thing. And then, uh, it was Trident Studios in London. I had the earphones on, listening to the band. And then there was And I said, I said, stop. I said, everybody, please. I have some feedback. In There's a feedback going on. And he said, no, that's your ghost. <laughs> Problem. Everything's clear. <laughs> and I uh, said, oh, okay. He's just going on. Yeah. Did she ever come out of the bag? Or was um, just... Did they bring oh, her in? Occasionally, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Occasionally, yeah. <laughs> they let her out. They, they bring the bag in with her in it. And just no, put her it's fine. It was just a, it was an odd expression. Yeah. And yeah. you'll go at this very... Yeah. Kind Wasn't of, she calling it bagism at the time? It was. She was calling it. I think she was calling it bagism. Man, I don't know. Bagism. So, I don't yeah. know. But um, it was. 
Let's say it was quite an experience at that age. But and then of course 20, John, that's normal, right? <laughs> and then of course John, the next thing I heard from John was Mal Evans, the Beatles, um, wrote, he called me up and he said, John wrote a song last night, bring your drums down, he wants to record it today and release it next week. <laughs> and I, I said, oh, uh, I said, I can do that. So I threw my drums in the back of a state car I had, went down to London, set them up, Went and, down to where? And it was in St. Combe. It's a palace, right? A castle. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean. And uh, I got into it, and um, we recorded the whole thing in the morning, and then um, had the track down, and they did this whole thing with the drum sound, and I played the drum break. And he said, Alan, I don't know what you're doing, but keep doing it. That's and always good news. That's the, the two drum breaks in the instrument. Oh, there's a, that, let, me, let me explain. There's a drum, he's talking about the John Lennon song, Imagine. I never heard of it. Yeah, who on earth has <coughs> heard of it? You know, it, it's a little obscure, but you know, yeah, you can look it up. Tiny little songs. And, the Beatles? So there's a, there's a drum fill in this song that Alan does. No, the, it's a calm. Oh, Instant Karma. It was Instant Karma. Oh, okay. oh, I did play in the match. Is that the... I'm thinking of something else. Is that the one at the it beginning? Goes. Yeah. That's it. Of course it does. <laughs> but it's in a different meter to the rest of the song. Yeah. The song's a shuffle, but it switches into rock and roll time and then goes back to the shuffle. Well, what about that fill in Imagine that you did? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, it's really... What? You know, left field. And yeah, I'm surprised I, that, know, like John said, I always, that's really cool. I, I always believed in doing what is necessary for the song. Listen to the song, listen to what people are playing, and do what is necessary. If you want to play a million fills in amongst everything, listen to the song, let the song breathe, and the vocals and what the song means, but still give it what you can. Did you do it in one in one take, or did you have to do a couple of takes? Uh, Instant Karma was done in about three takes. Mm. That's good. And Imagine. And Imagine was, I think, the, on the record, it's nine takes. But we listened to the first three as it was developing, um, and. Um, I think it was about the third or fourth take they actually used for the backing track. Mm -hmm. But with Imagine, I've got to tell you, there's a certain sense of, of community, Beatles, kind of like family thing in the room. And that's what you're listening to a lot, is we was just all eye contact. It was only a room 20 by 20. And a stand-up piano in the corner with John playing and... Um, and just looking at each other, and we all finished the track and looked around and said, I guess that's it. <laughs> you know, everybody knew that that was, had a special thing about like it. Like a camaraderie kind of yeah. feeling. Did it feel like a all-time classic song while you were doing it? Not really, it was part right. of an album because John gave us the lyrics to all of those songs before we performed them and we'd read through the lyrics and when I read the management, I went, whoa, this is incredible lyrics. I mean, this is just telling the world what's going on. Yeah. And um, give me some truth. He was angry, man, he would tell you. you know. Yeah. Uh, all of the songs had a certain meaning and you kind of got the character from the lyrics yeah. to add to the music. But at the same time, um, it was an amazing experience. Because we'd eat dinner together around the table in the evening, 7 o'clock, everybody dropped tools, we ate dinner, whether we finished the back and track or not. And it, um, that's when I met George, that led to me playing on All Things Must Pass. So, um, it was quite a thing going on at that kind of age in my life. And yeah. I, I didn't really realize it till years later and look back. Yeah, know? of course. 
Oh my God, did I do that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of yeah. course I did. Did you work, do you mind if I ask him questions? Please I'm ask curious him questions. Too. I'm waiting like patience on a monument over here. You yeah. guys, you guys just take, have yeah. fun between yeah, yourselves, yeah. okay? Hey everybody, they're gonna go at it. Great. Who was the producer on this stuff that you did on All Things Must Pass? Was it Phil Spector? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very and unique you know, individual. I got a, I yes. got a, I got a cough when I say that. <laughs> Was he waving yeah. his gun around? Again? I go and listen to playbacks, and there was a gun lying on the, in front of me. How did I not know that? <laughs> you know, I was going. Was and, gun, and guns in England, even the cops didn't. Have yeah, guns. yeah, but he was the most paranoid person I've ever met in my life. He was like, thought somebody was going to kill him at any time. Yeah. And I was there when we finished the track, and John said, here, yeah, and he handed a set of car keys, and he gave me his white Rolls, Rolls Royce with a painting on it. To and do he what said, with? Here, yeah, Phil, it's yours. You did a great job. And I went, get out of here. Oh, my God, I wish you'd done that. I mean, it was. Say that again. <laughs> yeah. So, and yeah, where is the car today? Who, 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 John gave the keys to who? Phil Spector. Oh, he gave him oh. the car. He gave him the car. Perfect. He had it flown back or shipped back to L.A. and drove it all around, right? Yeah. 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 Wow. Wow. Pretty amazing. Unbelievable. Anyhow, uh, the rest is history. And here we are. And now here we are. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. If, At the meanwhile, I'm in made, Georgetown. If you put this in a movie, nobody believes it. Yeah, you could. Meanwhile, I've been playing in Yes for the last 47 years, and that's another story. Yes. Oh, do tell. Do we have time for that story? <laughs> I think we do. No, it's. <laughs> Which it's too story? Long. <laughs> it's too long. Uh, but uh, the band is still going. I'm playing this summer, and we're doing 35 shows this summer. 35? Oh, my God. Wow. You guys just finished your 50th anniversary. Didn't you do the 50th last year? last year? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're doing 51st now? Well, we're not going to call it the 51st. <laughs> <laughs> There's a certain age you get to where you go, hmm. So you just use, uh, you don't use numbers no, anymore? It's like code letters or this something? This summer's too is going to be pretty good. It's more of a festival kind of thing. It's got full bands on it. It's got um, us headlining and then uh, John Ledge from the Moody Blues, so it's going to be kind of his solo stuff from Moody Blues. And then Carl Palmer, and he's going to have the crazy world of Arthur Brown. Oh, wow. Get out of here. It, singing fire, but that, uh, of course. and all dun, that dun, stuff. Dun, yeah. yeah. It'll be very cool. Wow. You know, I was in a hotel with my wife over Thanksgiving in San Francisco, and it brought, I think it was the Marriott. Um, and I, f I literally flashed back to 30 years ago when I came and visited you guys at that hotel. I, I, I hadn't even thought of it, right? But I'm in this hotel. It's one of the ones with the elevators that are open, you know. I mean, not open, but... Oh, yeah. And like you look clear down. Glass yeah, clear. Uh -huh. And I remembered in the... I don't know. It must have been the early 80s or late 70s. Well, the Hyatt's used. The Hyatt. It was a Hyatt. Yeah. And um, it was like an acid flashback. You know, it's like, damn. I visited, I visited Yes here 35 years ago. Don't tell me my memory's <laughs> not good. I know. Yeah. Well, uh, talking about hotels, we've been in so many of them now. It's like, yeah. you know. You learn, you learn how to handle our maid service, everything. You just say, do not disturb. And then Period. you go take the sign off the door. And if they knock, you just say, go away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and did, how many, um, how many uh, hotel rooms have you trashed in your time? <laughs> See, Julie, see, Julie, Nancy sings. Julie wanted to How get many to her. hairs are on my head? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. No, many. I told you. It's a the bed. Everybody didn't do that. No. You didn't? Hey, Mark, I need another no. adult. No, I was like incense please. and, you know, changed the whole room. I was the guy that would put, um, you know, things over the lights and get the whole mood going. And 
Really? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. stylized your hotel room? Absolutely, every one. I usually was so tired or had a few beers and I just hit the sack like you wouldn't believe. Mm. You know, it's extremely... Um, it, you know, it, it takes a lot out Don't of you. blow it, Alan. Yeah. Just keep them thinking it's all glamorous. <laughs> No, it yes. does. I mean, it's really tiring on the road. Yeah, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. You travel every day, and and you get to a hotel. All you want to do is put your feet up. And, mm. Do you guys fly on a private plane now? No. No. We used to them in uh, the early days, but now we travel in different means. Some of the guys travel on our bus now, and yeah. Um, yeah. some of us fly. And um, Steve Howe drives himself. Well, he doesn't drive himself, but he drives everywhere. Mm -hmm. Hires a car for the whole tour, drives everywhere. Wow, really? And, um, you know, does his own thing. Eats, eats the same food. He was eating like 55 years ago. Vegetarian. He's been a, he's been a veggie ever since then. Oh, ever since then, huh? Yeah, he's... Um, does he bring his own chef too, or he does his own? No, thing? no. Gets to the city, finds the local vegetarian mm -hmm. restaurant, and goes and eats. And he's a clean machine. Beer's vegetarian too. <laughs> that's, that's true. Yes. So how did you two meet? I mean, you've yes. known each other a I long time. I was just going to say time. that. How did we nice. meet? Yeah. We met here. Um, I didn't know Alan until Not I... at this place. No. <laughs> <laughs> really? Here, 35 it's, years it's, ago. Uh, yeah. right? The bar next door. Oh, okay. yeah, it's well. been there since cowboy time, so it could have been. You know, what are you going to do? Uh, we, I moved here in 89 from San Francisco. Prior to that, I was in New York for 10 years. And I started doing um, a thing for Bumbershoot Festival called Bumber Drum mm. every mm -hmm. year. Mm. And it was the most exciting opportunity. The, the mission was the whatever you can get out of all the acts that are here and still here on Sunday, um, put a drum thing together. And I believe that's where we met. I'm, I'm one of those. Yeah, I did. I, I yeah. did it a couple of times. And then, um, and then we see each other, each other we see it everywhere, world. you know. But we're, around. we're also both uh, quite involved in some charity things. Right. A lot Let's of caring do. project. We're okay. both uh, Seattle Theater Group. Seattle Theater Group, the board, who I think are, they do wonderful work. Melodic caring project. Melodic caring project is this in amazing um, nonprofit that brings um, music into the rooms of quarantine kids, young kids in hospitals around the country. Started, of course, here. Um, and they can't go out and they can't be around their friends. So... So they're just all uh, by themselves. A guy named Levi Ware and his wife Stephanie, they're, they're kind of angels on earth, mm -hmm. started going and visiting these kids and just playing music. Just, mm. you know, the kind yeah. of thing we're supposed to do. And then they thought up the idea of what's the healing power of music, and they started asking artists, can we live stream your concert into this kid's room, the individual kid? Their friends can't be in there, but they can, they're all linked up to a network, so they're all talking. Mm -hmm. And the artists will talk to the kids. Sounds wonderful. On the stage, and spe you know, especially to them. So we and... Um, my wife and Alan's wife, Gigi, believe in this uh, is something. There's a lot of things that come your way when you're, they, they yeah, like yeah, you to do yeah. something. This is so beautiful and so perfect. Sounds um, wonderful. Yeah. yeah, so. Yeah, and I'm, I'm involved with Music Aid Northwest. Right. Okay. And we did a license plate that funds schools. Right. And music instruments and right. all that kind of stuff. So in our way, we're helping the city from what we've experienced, I yeah. guess, and, uh, and just providing That's as fantastic. much as we can. Yeah, I know you guys just did a, a fundraiser over at the Triple Door, correct? Yeah. Oh, it was just a few weeks ago. What? Didn't you do it a few weeks ago, the fundraiser over at the Triple Door? Neptune. Yeah. Or the Neptune. Neptune. Okay, Neptune. that's what it was, sorry. It was the Neptune. 
So that's it. I, I think it's, it's actually, I would highly encourage artists to um, be involved with nonprofits, with um, schools, education. I know a lot of them are when they can. And, uh, it's really uh, you know, there's another one that I have to bring up that would, just happened again last weekend called More Music at the Moore. Mm. Seattle Theater Group. More Theater? Yeah. Okay. Seattle Theater Group is really a wonderful organization and, and very community conscious as well. And I started this thing with a woman named uh, Vicki Lee out of um, Seattle Theater Group. It wasn't my idea. It was her idea and Carlene Brown, another wonderful woman, to bring young high school age musicians, but with a folk, you know, talented, talented, but with the focus on being inclusive of and actively pursuing um, kids from like Cambodia or this, and not just like the yeah. high schools, but mm -hmm. going out to neighborhoods and looking for talented kids. And, sure. and that was 15 years ago and it's, um, I did the first four as a music director, but since then they've had the most incredible, like world famous musicians coming in and like Sheila E or uh, Robert Glasper or all these world class oh, wow. people who take these kids and what you do is you create a show, an hour and a half show mm -hmm. in a week. And it's, it's a wonderful thing. So there's these kind of things that are happening in Seattle need to be supported. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, I, so. I know Seattle's going through a lot of changes right now, I think. and, and um, you know, it's it's a very in interesting time, I think, and and <clears throat> yeah, I, I, you know, I won't go there. Yeah, I actually was able to go to the last um, KEXP mixer that the oh, what was it, Seattle uh, Music Commission hosts. Every, uh -huh. I think it's every third Wednesday over there. I went with my cousin. Uh, where they talk about all the various um, uh, things going on around Seattle and some of the issues that uh, that are hitting uh, Seattle venues, Seattle uh, music, you know, educa education uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, opportunities for kids, um, uh, and and it was really interesting. It's it's, a, it's kind of a think tank type of mixer mm -hmm. thing where everybody gets together and they start talking about things that are going on. Uh, in the city, uh, issues that are coming up, opportunities that are coming up, things that are getting pushed through the council. Sure. Um, and I, I am aware, obviously, that there are some issues, particularly um, with uh, people getting priced out of practice spaces. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I've seen this happen in San Francisco. I'm from yeah. San Francisco. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And. Um, it's amazing. I mean, I, 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 I don't have a solution or anything like that, but I you know it's called rooftops in the summer. Yeah. Bring your drum kit up on a rooftop in the summertime. You got an instant concert. Get the whole thing laid out. You got a riser. Definitely drum riser on top of a rooftop. See, isn't this a cool idea? That'll help the homeless. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I actually... You think that's a good idea? Yeah, I think See, that's I, a good I idea. knew you were cool. Yeah. Yeah, I was just saying, it's, it's, it's just getting, um, especially with the real estate in Seattle right now, uh, a lot of spaces are getting sold, picked up, yeah. prices yeah. are going up. It's, a, it's, it's, it's not an uncommon situation that's going on, but you mm -hmm. see what's going on in the, in the major cities. The rate of homelessness is... Um, uh, disturbing. It's, it's, it, I think. Disturbing. It's like third world stuff going on. And, and obviously what's happening is the discrepancy in, in money. Um, yeah. Okay, we're getting but anyway, political. Yeah, so, <laughs> let's, so let's, drink let's and tell rock and roll and stories. Yeah, 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 yeah. Stories. Okay. Do you need another Philip? Yeah, Michael? sure. Okay. Hey, Mark, at your convenience, what are you drinking? The Pinot. Uh, Pinot at your, thank you. So there is a picture that we uh, we were going through your website and we did find a picture. So this is a good way to segue, right? Yeah, yeah this uh, is really good. Julie uh, needs to know. Yeah, I need to know. There was a picture of you. It, it, I don't know. It's it looks like uh, Suggs from from Madness, but I wasn't sure. Uh, but it, and it, Diamond Dave. It had uh, David Lee Roth in it. Oh, and Todd Rundgren and Rick Darren. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was yeah, like, yeah, okay, yeah. there we go. Okay. 
is this story? David looks really confused, so I, I, I was wondering if there was some it sort of It looks like you caught him by surprise. Yeah, so what was and the David story? David is very him? rarely surprised. He's like a martial arts dude. He's, you know, he's usually on the ball. I don't know. It How was, much did he have to drink that night? I don't know. Uh, you know, I don't know the guy. Um, <laughs> I knew Todd. I had done some work with Todd. Yeah, we all know Todd. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Todd's so Todd's an interesting character? Todd's brilliant. Yeah. No, I have nothing but good things to say about him. He's brilliant. So I had done a tour with Todd, um, and a, to a tour with Todd and Ian Hunter and Mick Ronson. Oh. Did he and bring the buffalo? <laughs> no. Uh, oh, good. what? <laughs> he used to go on stage in the old days on a buffalo. Oh my God! What's a buffalo? A buffalo is an animal that usually. <laughs> okay, come on. He would really, literally <laughs> ride on a buffalo. Yeah, I yeah, thought yeah. this was a nickname or something. A, they had a tour and they they were on a bus and they went around America. They had a trailer with a buffalo in it. Are you kidding me? I never even heard of that. No, oh, well, it was. I'll trade you a yeah. full Thanks. one for an empty one. So uh, this was a, a political tour, a fundraiser for Anderson for president that Todd put together. And so I had done one other, one record with Todd with a, a woman named Jill Sobule. I don't know if anybody knows her. Yeah. She's the first one that wrote the song, I Kissed a Girl. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, I did this record with him at his place in Woodstock. So I knew him. I visited backstage, it just at, we're talking about this photo. Yeah. And um, so it was Todd and the band, Utopia, who I just saw here a couple months ago, which is a really great show. And um, so David Lee Roth was there and Rick Derringer, who was, uh, you know. Um, Rick Derringer. <laughs> Rick Derringer, you know. And uh, that's all. I mean, it was nothing it was but a, a, a photo that yeah, my girlfriend at the time took, like a snap. and. That's it. <laughs> Nothing heavy. Was he was he there with Van Halen or just there on his own? Um, you you like him, huh? No, I, <laughs> no, no, I just he, he looked like he was dressed up for something. Yeah. That's why I was. Yeah, I, it, yeah. I didn't I'm know a big David Lee Roth fan. I really I think he's one of the greatest front men in the history of rock and roll. He's got to be up in the top five. Yeah. That's yeah. When he, with Van Halen. You know, when he used to sing with Van Halen, it was like. <laughs> you didn't like. I, 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 we should have stayed there when he did all that kind of surfing oh, like when he went off California and did his own stuff. Singles. Yeah, it was weird, but um, I'm still a big Dave. Dave, if you're listening, I met him in a nightclub in LA a couple mm. of times, and he was like, "Where this stardom you got came from?" You know, it was like shining star walking, like he owned the place. But he's <laughs> he's actually when you told him who you were, but he went. Boom. You know, it was, um, but he, he put on that phony accent all the time, and it mm. used to drive me nuts, you know. Well, he just started his podcast again, just oh. just last week or the week before. And I, 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 I'm not say I'm a David Lee Roth, that's why right. so research this stuff, Julie. Okay. And David Lee Roth just started his podcast uh, last week or the week before. Yeah, again. So I listened to the first show. Let's nice change the subject. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Here we go. What do you want to talk about there, Mike? Bad, uh, just <laughs> bad, believe it or not. Not him. We're all really good friends in the music business, with a slight exception. Somewhere. Slight exceptions, okay. Now, do you. I don't know if I agree with that. Oh, <laughs> really? Mm -hmm. Well, are there. Because I know that there's this whole myth making in the music industry, um, you know, of, of the myth of. of Debauchery, the myth of, of you know certain people myth? fighting, and well, I think you know I, I think some of it is kind of BS. You know, I think that it's, it's like you there's think some a little, of the stories are a little yeah, long there's a and seed, and then there's this it getting kind of bigger and bigger and bigger. Like the whole thing about everybody <laughs> trashing your hotel rooms. I'm sure maybe some people have, but I, I don't know. Have you ever, you've done that? What's that? Trash a hotel room? I've never done that I'm in my life. I'm close to that. Close to it, but, but not like it's not Keith. But it's, no, not, it, it, it's not I, Keith Moon, like you know, no, mythical no, yeah. stuff. You know, there's no footprints on the ceiling there. or anything. I was there mentally, but I passed out before I even got okay. there. Okay. But yeah, I, yeah. But I remember one story when I joined. Yes, I was the new guy in town, and they were very impish and playing. Everybody played jokes on each other. Mm -hmm. 
the whole band. We were in a Holiday Inn on Lake Erie, and, and the swimming pool was frozen over, right? So we did the gig. I came back at night, and then all of my furniture in the room was on the swimming pool. No. <laughs> and I had no way to see. Really? And I went. Did you have to skate out there to get it? It all happened, yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, there's some crazy things from back in the 70s, a lot of bands did. And, uh, you know, in Holiday Inn, in the middle of nowhere, you don't know anybody. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, you tried to have fun any way you could, you know. So I remember one night in one Holiday Inn, it was full size to the hotel, and they were building a swimming pool in the middle. One of those places. Mm -hmm. and there was a bulldozer there, and I I decided to drive the bulldozer <laughs> at one o'clock in, in the it? morning. <laughs> and they had the keys in, it, and I started driving it, and we got thrown out the hotel. So. Wow. Well, did you just drive it off, or did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Did you no, I just was having bulldozer? fun going, <laughs> and they anyhow. I, 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 I was, Did you ever drive a bulldozer, Mike? No, I was the I was the guy in the back of the bus reading a book. Oh yeah, oh yeah, or, or those types, or headphones sure. and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I believe. I really, <laughs> you believe me? <laughs> uh, it's actually it's true. Okay. Mm. I remember doing this thing. I mean, in talking about this type of thing about reading a book. Um, I did this record, which is a really odd record for me even career-wise or drumming-wise or anything, called HSAS with Sammy Hagar okay. and Neil Sean and Kenny Aronson, oh, wow. a, a great bass player, who I just saw with the Yardbirds coming through here, which that stuff still sounds so great, and, um, and myself. So we went to see R.E.M. before they were big at a place called the Kabuki Theater in San Francisco. And I didn't know the guys, and Kenny said, I'm going to go back and uh, say hello. And I sat in my seat, and um, I probably should have gone back. But um, anyway, he came back, and he said, man, you're not going to fucking believe it. He's like this, you know, like New York. These motherfuckers are back there reading. <laughs> 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 They're fucking reading books, man. <laughs> and I'm like... Hey, Kenny, you sound like West Side Story. Get, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of like Brooklyn intellectual. What? Yeah, I'm like These guys over here. I'm telling you, they're reading books over here. Yeah, get... and I'm like, are you kidding? <laughs> they're not warming up, and you know, and I was just like, oh boy, you know. Well, that blows a myth. Yeah, I, can, I yeah. read books at the same time too. Get out yeah, of here. Yeah. yeah, no, I know. I was I, reading I, Daphne and Chloe by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. And all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Way back then. Ah, uh, you know, I used to carry a trunk with me, a literally a trunk, because we had slaves, you know. Uh, really? <laughs> to carry everything. With, with Santana. Now I'm with Santana, and it's like, uh, and I had it filled with LPs, mm -hmm. and I had the first portable stereo record player, a suitcase mm -hmm. model, mm -hmm. and the speakers went out like this, uh -huh. and you could put them up in your room. That's, you light my incense, have the candles, and this. I'd have Miles Davis, Bitches Brew playing, or some shit like that. Yeah, that's and it's album. like, I used to play that yeah. Album. And I have a practice kit in there. Yeah. I was like, you know, that kind of guy. Uh -huh. And um, I swear to God, like, girls would come to the, like hanging out with Carlos, for instance. Girls would come to the room, and we'd be listening to Aretha Franklin or something, you know, just into it, into it. And they're like, you know, like, where's the party, you know? Yeah, we're like, yeah, there's a book uh, over there you could read that, honey. There's, there's a guy in the book. band called Chapito. He's in room uh, 306. Go, there's the party, oh, you know. Okay. Uh, tell me, you know, I spent many nights with Chris Rice. Um, I got a, I got a wine, bottle of wine or two, right? And he said, I, I, um, I'm going upstairs, I'm going to find a party. He walked down the, the dip, 
different floors of the hotel, listen to doors going, oh, there's a party in here, knock on the door with a couple of bottles of wine. And <laughs> that was it. Looking for the party? Yes. We, we had a good Listening time. Listening for the party. <laughs> we had a good time whether we were reading books or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Exercising your brain and your body. Oh, well, some nights we were trying to find the brain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so what do you, what do hey, you Dan, want? Dan, how are we doing for time? Oh, you're yeah, way over time. We're way over time? You guys, you guys okay? Yeah. You guys, how about you guys? You guys having a good time? Okay. You want to keep on going a little longer? Yeah, ask okay. questions or okay. they can ask questions. Yes, yeah, so you guys have any questions? All right. Chuck? Oh, I do. Of course, Chuck. I, I'm expecting one out of you. Um, you were at both Woodstock and Alcabon, Mr. Tree. Yeah. What can you tell us a little bit about each one as far as did you just accept it, do it as a gig, or did you come out of each how did you come out of each one? Yeah, they're very different, of course. Yeah. Both of them are very different. Woodstock was um, unexpected. We, we were touring with Santana. Already we were playing the Dallas Pop Festival, the Atlanta Pop Festival, I think Florida, big, big festivals. You know, and always with the San Francisco groups um, and other national groups as well. Jefferson Airplanes, um, Janice, Big Brother, a bunch of them. And we didn't even have a record out. When we played Woodstock, we did not have a record out. I did not know that. Our record wasn't, so we were unknown everywhere we went. But Bill Graham was our manager. And so he put us on all these bills because he knew we could deliver live. And so live was our strength. And it was very different too. The the band was different with the congas and the timbales and so Woodstock was another gig. But we we wouldn't have been on it if it wasn't for Bill because when Michael Lang and John Roberts and the producers of Woodstock realized what they were into, they realized they were a little over their heads, and they called on Bill Graham and asked them, "Could you help?" and and he said he would, probably for a certain amount of money. Um, plus, I want a couple of bands on that bill. And he presented them with a couple of bands, and they chose Santana. And so we we have been touring extensively through America on that in that summer of '69, and we rented a house for two weeks in Woodstock prior to the concert set up all the gear and you know we were it was like a pretty hippie situation but we were not really a hippie band we rehearsed every day we just rehearsed every single day and then at night in San Francisco we'd go to the Fillmore we could get them for free we'd rehearse all day and then we'd go and check out the see what's happening what's the competition we were not a hippie band I, I, as I said in my, well, I'll just say, what I always say is uh, this was no peace and love thing. This was like a street gang, and the message was the music. So uh, the weapon was the music. Sorry, I'm trying to remember. Um, so Woodstock, the day comes. This a great story I got to tell you, though. Greg Raleigh, the singer, said he took a drive around Woodstock, the whole area, and he... he Interesting ended, you use the term dry run, because uh, it was raining like hell. And yeah. I mean, Greg was driving around the Woodstock area while we were there in the, yeah. those two weeks, and um, he came behind this car that was going so slow, it was driving him crazy. It's just really, you know, he's honking this and this. Finally, he passed the guy, and he looked over, and it was Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Just, you know, chill. 
<laughs> yeah. So we so Woodstock. So we're watching on TV actually at the place we're renting. It's like, you know, this thing is happening and the highways are closed down and all these young people are coming to this place and it keeps growing and growing and growing. Like it's a it's a live um, what's the word um, fluid situation and and so turns out we had to fly in a, a helicopter. So to get to that helicopter, we had to go to the Holiday Inn uh, in this place, and everybody was staying there. Uh, we weren't, we, we had a house, but, so we flew in with g people in the Gra Grateful Dead and Janis Joplin into Woodstock. And from that point of view, it was, whoa, you know, whoa. It was, it was like, yeah, it was a sea of people. <clears throat> and so we land, and once you get backstage, all your friends are there and stuff, you know. I'm not big for, like, wandering around the crowd and, you know, like, hey, you know, I don't even like crowds. <laughs> so, um... There's only four of us here at the table, so <laughs> you should be comfortable. To this day, I'm not comfortable in concert crowds. Did you or bring a book? Anything. <laughs> no, I didn't. No. I got something for you to read at the core. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, we thought that we were going to be playing later, and then they came up to us and said, you got to go on, like, quick. Otherwise, you're not going to play. And Carlos and I had taken some substances. I'm shocked as hell. Like, <laughs> and, and, and the truth is, I, don't, I didn't make a habit of doing that at all. Mm -hmm. uh, one time it happened, uh, we played a gig with Jefferson Airplane and Grateful Dead at a place in uh, San Francisco, and that's on video, where I made the mistake of just having some of the punch. <laughs> and realizing... They don't call it punch for that. There's a yeah, reason. I mean, I, I just like went like, you idiot, you know, it's the Grateful Dead. So, um, I don't like playing high, even to this now, I don't even like having a drink before I play. But um, we took some mescaline, and um, then they said, you know, we thought we'd be done, and, but, and they said, you gotta go on now. It's always bad news. And so, <laughs> and so I we, did, we, we played. The term. I did it once. I took the LSD before I played with Terry Reed oh, yeah. in Germany. And somebody topped the whole band up before we went on without me knowing. You know, That's no terrible. Uh, That's terrible. And then you get through about two or three songs, girl. Um, Something's different doing? here. Yeah. And it's it, yeah. How come everybody has yeah. three heads? Yeah. Plus, yeah. the problem, problem was, it was a club that was like psychedelic to start with. It had right. painted yellow cameras and painted people walking. Oh, it was like nightmare. So it was already for I said, when you guys, in. okay, cut the show now because wow. it's not going to be good. We're going to think we're good. But we're not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. That's a big problem. Exactly. Well, for me, um, it was a delightful experience, and and the music was just it was heightened, and it was the thing about us at Woodstock since we had no record, nobody knew us, and we played in a tight little circle. We weren't outward entertainers, you know. We weren't. We were like this to each other, and so that probably saved us. Yeah. It was the music and we were into the music and and as you can see in the video, it was delightful to me, you know. So um, I, I I I don't even talk about it. I don't wanna say that really, yeah. you know, but here yeah, we are, I it's know. the fiftieth year and what the <laughs> fuck. Yeah, what are you gonna yeah. do? Yeah. Yeah. Well I think my about kids that. are grown up and you know yeah. it's the same, it was a beautiful it's the thing. Same with me. I did um, Glastonbury Festival in England, yeah. mm -hmm. the very first Woodstock in England kind of mm -hmm. thing. And um, Terry Reid played there, and I spent the whole time playing with these Brazilian guys, charms and stuff, it was so incredible. And um, we got on stage, and 
they made a movie out of it. And when the, the movie comes on, it was shown in all the big cinema houses yeah. in England. And the first shot is me smoking the joint about that. <laughs> <laughs> this big? And then, and then Spliff. I, well, Spliff. I, I'm kind of going like, <laughs> And then I pass it to the bass player, and we just start playing. And I said, "Oh my God, I can't even go anywhere. I'm going to get busted anywhere, yeah, or, you know, yeah. for a while." But um, it's it's pretty crazy to see those old things and the footage of it. I know, like you playing your solo. Yeah, I, you the know. solo it was fine. Although I listen to it now, or I see it. I don't really ever go there. Um, yeah, because I know, if I, I listen know, without don't. the video, I think it's really shit, you know? <laughs> but with the video, yeah, what's your real and, thing I'm, and I'm, playing, I'm playing a groove, I'm playing a groove, I'm playing a groove, and then I stop. It was wonderful. Come on. I know, I know. <laughs> but but, but you've got to hear it from my point of view, because when I stopped the groove and I started like, you know, you know, this kind of... I listen to it now, I'm going like, what are you thinking? <laughs> you had a 500,000 people, you got a groove, and you stopped it, you know? So, that was you being master of what you were doing at a very early age. Me in know? the moment, yeah. It was like you being inventive and kind yeah. of like... It worked out. Construction. <laughs> exactly. Now, Altamont. So Altamont's a whole different story, and... Um, oh, yes. So yeah. different. A a again... Worst uh, ending. A helicopter in. Um, this was the Stones thing. Total different vibe. Oh my God! As soon as we got there, as soon as we got there, you could tell it was not organized. The stage was like this high. Really? This high, and the audience there, and the Hell's Angels were as security. Security, and they were right there all around you. Totally fucked up. You know, you think? I'm. I swear to God, I'm. I'm on this. We. I think we opened, and we did a good set. But if you look at the pictures that are available, you'll see what a mess it is. You'll see like oh, yeah. it's just people right behind you and in front of you, mm -hmm. no security, except for like these hell's angels. And this guy, I kept seeing this guy with horns, a hat with horns, right? And. I, I really mean this. I was very conscious of the fact that I felt evil. I had never yeah, really... You could just you could just kind of feel it. The energy was you so can, dark. You can see that. Really? It was, it, it was, I've seen pictures in movies of that stuff, and it felt weird. Yeah, yeah. it, I, it felt weird. weird yeah, watching that... It just the, weird, the frequency, Donald, was, um, you know, really... Uh, so as soon as we got done, I was like, I'm getting the hell out of here. I went out to get a helicopter, and that's when Phil Lesh and Jerry Garcia came up. And that's the only part in the film that yeah. we are where they're like, hey, you know, <laughs> hey, you know, isn't this great? You know, wow. You know, I'm like, it's really fucked up, man. <laughs> yeah. And they say, wow, what's going on? Hell's Angels are beating everybody up. They just beat Marty up, you know. Marty got shit yeah. beat out of with Jefferson Airplane. Huh? Um, oh, it was dark, and all the people, and they said, no, no way. I'm saying, dude, they just beat the shit out of Marty, and I'm getting the hell out of here. And, you know, it's so funny to see myself in that thing. It's really weird, man. It's really weird. And I'm thinking, I'm a book reader. Can I do better than that? Exactly. But anyway, that was that. Was that. It was just so. So later, later we got out and we were in London, and and we got invited to see a uh, the film with Mick and Charlie, because they were kind of the producers, and we decided to not be in the film because it was so dark. Yeah. But in retrospect, I wish we would have had our performance in there because, for historical value, you know. Did you like that performance better than you like the Woodstock one after seeing it? Or? I, I, I don't know. No? Okay. I don't remember. I, don't, I really don't remember the quality of the performance, you know. I mean, I remember other things that we did that were better, much better than Woodstock, 
like Tanglewood, which is on YouTube, oh, yeah. a year later, and that, the solo is oh. much better. You know, okay. it's just the visual and the moment at Woodstock was the thing that I stopped. I stopped arguing with people about it. That there's better things. Go check this out. You know, and it's like forget <laughs> about it. You know. I would I would say to people, have you heard this that I've done? Have you heard this like just Woodstock, man? We love you in Woodstock, you know. Um, and it, it took me a long time until I was 35 years old, where I somebody approached me on the streets of New York and he said, "Man, I love your performance at Woodstock. It's like you're getting older, though." We I all said, do. And I said, <laughs> last time I checked, wow. hold on a second. I said, man, really? you think so? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a very profound statement there, yeah. young man. And so what I decided to do to save myself was just be grateful that people appreciate something that you did, even though they never listen to anything else you do, and, <laughs> and, and, and have gratitude that you did something that moves right. people enough that it yeah. still sticks with them. Sure. So. I think even in the arts, we have the same thing. I yeah, can you sign this magic card? Oh, that you did 25 years yeah, ago? Yeah, exactly. And you're, like, oh. you're like, oh my god. And that's like when I, I, I think I told you, uh, it's, it's really weird to see my artwork that I did in college, because I was in college when yeah, Magic yeah, the Gathering. Yeah, yeah, I know. You're about up. that old. You're a teenager, aren't you? I'm almost 50. Oh my god. Really? Yeah. Oh, Way god. into 50. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I was in college though. I was still in college. I hadn't graduated yet. The game blew up. And so seeing my stuff go to auction, like a piece of mine just went on the auction. And went so what was your stuff? Oh, you know magic? I know, because I used to take my kid to Lake City oh, Way, okay. where they had this, oh, yeah. this, had this whole center that yeah, was a, right. like a cult. And, yeah, uh, it is. And um, well, I did, uh, like, I did clone, uh, mind twist. You, uh, you, you did the drawings? Yeah, yeah. both Brian and I both did. Both oh, did. wow. Yeah. I can't afford to buy my own cards, by the way. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Underworld Dreams just wow. uh, auctioned for 31000 and Are I'm you like, kidding? And I'm like, what? I didn't get, thank yeah, you. isn't that weird? How I didn't get a piece of that? did in college. Is worth more than the stuff I do now. So a card, wow. not the original, not, not the original artwork, a card, uh, something I did. I, I signed it for this guy. It's twelve thousand dollars for the card. God yeah. knows what the original artwork is going for. I painted it in about four hours. You got paid fifty bucks. I like get I did, paid fifty we got bucks. Paid 50 bucks. I a sold card. the original for a hundred and fifty. Yeah, I sold mine for a hundred. Because I needed gasoline in my car. Yeah. You know. I needed groceries. Wow. Yeah, is that how much we're getting tonight? Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is a five hundred dollar beer bill. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Wow. Um, but it's the same thing, you know. Mm -hmm. you, I know. If you say I look at Soul Sacrifice on on YouTube. And there's 31 million views. Mm -hmm. Should be some money there, right? <laughs> you think? Yeah. Not for me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Not for me. Yeah, yeah we don't see the money. But you know what? I, you could get bitter, but it's like, look, I did something. Hey, man. When I was young. Sure. I did what it did. And, um, you know, yeah, if people love know, what you did when you were young. We do this for the love of it. Right. You are 100% correct. That's true. I yeah. can't argue with one thing you said. I'm there. kind of like, Back and forth oh, with that. No, oh, stop God. it. <laughs> That's another show, everybody. <laughs> I'll pay you. Okay. Well, one thing I gotta ask you. Yes. I gotta ask you. Okay. So yeah. you did play with Jacko Pastorius, correct? Yes, I did. Yeah, I knew Jacko. You guys, Jacko. You guys uh, recorded together. Yeah. And you never released I've it. I've never heard it. You've never even heard it. What? But it's a great story. So shall I tell the story? Yes. Yes. Not to drop names. Okay. <laughs> but. I was sitting in my apartment in New York City one summer, which is very hot, and I was, and I got a call from Mick Jagger. And so Mick says, hi, Michael. Uh, I'm not going to bother trying the accent. Come on, it's fun. You can do it for everybody. There's he one. did Yoko. You uh, can yeah. do it. Yeah, he did Yoko. You got you to gotta, okay, do Mick, Michael. Uh, I was just saying, we're down here in the Bahamas and making a record, and I was thinking of you of playing drums on it. Would you be interested in coming down? I said, you know. Okay. <laughs> so I went down there, and Jeff Beck's there, okay. and um, uh, so a bunch of Michael Hedges. Yeah. And we did the record. And I stayed with Mick, just me and him, at Chris Blackwell's place. Which oh. Was, yeah. And, and Mick is 
very fantastic guy. He's, I can't say enough my about him. My uncle actually has met him. My uncle used to work Chris for Westwood Hartgrove. One. He's, mm -hmm. He said he's Chris amazing. Well, Chris is amazing too, but Mick is amazing. Like, Mick would have a dinner, like invite the engineers in the band. No, he's wonderful. But he would serve. So he's a very gracious person. He's okay. very gracious, like oh, yeah. a lot of class, See, a lot of, it's like no, very yeah, much. And every guys. day he'd get up and he'd do out in the patio, like lift weights and do this. Every day he'd Would have... Would you do it like this? Or just no. it. <laughs> Come on. Sorry. Settle down, Julie. Let him yeah, tell right. the story. Okay. <laughs> um, Seth's going to be on a loop someday. Yeah, right. Yeah. I know. Be careful. Uh, so, no, he's, he's very gracious and very disciplined. And he'd have this, the... What's the game? The Indians, you know, the it's not... Football in England, but the um, cricket. No? cricket. Yeah. Every well, every day mean, cricket. What's the game? It's cricket. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, the English cricket. Yeah. So the cr cricket would be flown yes. in on videotape every day, like wow. by FedEx, because oh, really? he was so into it. So we'd mm. be watching these cricket games all night long. Yeah. And it's um, like watching paint dry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. So. What was I getting at? I don't know. We were talking about Jacko. We were talking about Jacko. We were talking about... Jock, okay, Jocko. So later okay. in New York City, I'm at the Power Station Studios mixing. I mean, I'm hanging out. Mm -hmm. Mick is, is with Niall Rogers, oh, who's wow. mixing the album okay. at the Power Station. It's about 2 in the morning, and this guy opens the door in the room, and it's Jocko Pastorius in oh. full Indian paint. Wow. Like, if you don't know, Jocko Pastorius, one of the most incredible. accomplished, incredible, life-changing bass players in the, in the world of music, who played with the Weather Report and, and Joni Mitchell and other people. But he was bipolar and had some issues. And he came in, he goes, Michael! And he's like, not looking at Mick, not looking at Niall. I heard you were here. We're downstairs cutting some tracks, dude. You gotta come down. I'm calling all the guys, you know. Oh my God. And so I went and uh, we recorded two drummers and all, all the great studio, New York studio musicians. Never heard anything. Saw Jocko about six weeks later, six months later on the street in New York. And he, he said, man, how you doing, Michael? I'm saying, good. Whatever happened to those recordings we did? He said, man, they, they won't give them to me. What? I said, did you pay for them? <laughs> <laughs> what was his answer? Let me guess. Well, no, but I mean, you know, he just thought, you know, uh -huh. he's, yeah. he's yeah. Jocko. Yeah, forget right. about it. Yeah, yeah, give me my stuff. Yeah. Jocko but Jocko, Pastorius you know. So it's I, 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 another Jocko story. Is it still what, what happened to the recording? Shut up, Brian. Oh, it's what there somewhere. <laughs> another Jocko story. He's, this is a brilliant genius. There's a small club in New York City downtown in Soho. It was called 55 Grand. The great guitar player Mike Stern partly owned it and lived upstairs. Jocko would always be hanging out there, so they, they would play, so people would go, and I was there one night, sitting at the bar, and, and Jocko was sitting next to me, talking on the phone, and he said, hey baby, okay, check this out. And he puts the phone down, and they go do like an hour and a half set. <laughs> and you're on the phone all the time? <laughs> no, I'm not on the phone. And he comes back and he goes, what'd you think? <laughs> I don't think there was anybody there. What do you mean? <laughs> the sound he used to get. Oh, yeah. Everything about his playing was just one of a kind. Yeah. Really? Yeah. You uh, know, I've got a story about that because Chris Quay, I used to say, another you know one. That bass player called, you know, Chris was outstanding in a lot of ways. He was innovative as, mm -hmm. you know, he was like the lead guitarist, but. Almost Jacko was like that yeah. within the music and his style. And we used to have a room next to each other in the hotels, and he went, Oh, that guy. And I go, Okay, but I used to get up in the morning and I put it on loud as hell and I play Weather Report. <laughs> and then 
you say, what was that you playing this morning? And I said, that was weather report, Jacko Pastorius. <laughs> and he go, oh. And you know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he had his own thing. But but Chris had his own sound, and, and also fretless as well, right? Fretless as well. Uh, fish out of water. Is that fish his, out his of water. Yeah. You know, that Bill, Bill played on most of that. I played on one track. It's a great record. It was a great record and of Chris's. Uh, uh, I, I played a, 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 I made a Christmas single with Chris called Running With A Fox, which is one of the greatest pieces of music we ever did, I think, in amongst all of your stuff. Wow. It was amazing. And um, I think we should release it today, actually. Yeah, sure, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because it never came out in America. It came out wow. in England. Wow, really? Yeah. Is yeah, because, do it. Well, is, is you dig deep and you'll find Run With A Fox. And, uh, oh, I'll dig deep. Yeah. Well, so, yeah, let's dig in. Now, is it just that it was released overseas and just not over in the States? It got or? released in England only. Oh, interesting. Mm. And it never came to America. So, interesting. Go find it. Okay. Okay. I'll I will do dig. that. In fact, in, in New York, I signed a copy of the single. Some, some fan. Really? Obviously, it was an import, yeah. Hmm. Aww. Was it an import or was it a. Uh, Bootleg? Well, no, it was uh, actually had the picture of the fox on the cover. Oh, really? Run with the fox. It was a very yeah, was Christmassy <laughs> kind of thing and had uh, fox horns blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Right. Very do cool. you guys have, like, do you, do you have your own personal best? Like, you did something that you're like, this is the best thing I've ever done, hands down, don't care what anyone thinks. Um, do you guys have... Something that you did. That it's a good like, question. What do you think, Alan? Um, I, I was kind of proud of um, a lot of the stuff I did prior to years. With uh, uh, my first solo album is called Ramshackle, mm -hmm. and we, we used to live in a house in England when you know Genesis and traffic and all those people who were living in houses and I had a band, a seven piece band with three horns. I just loved playing with horn players. It's yeah. one of my favorite things. And um, what kind of stuff was it? Uh, semi jazz, semi zapperish and lots of time signatures, mm -hmm. changes and stuff like that in different places. And um, you know, it was really great music. We we go to bed at night, get up in the morning, make breakfast, eat breakfast, and play all day. That's where traffic came from, and a lot yeah. of great musicians from England. That doesn't happen That's anymore. What we did. I, I, I want to point wonderful. that out. You know, I mean, the same with Santana. We would rehearse all day, every day. That's where we were not a hippie thing. It was it was like. Like, this is our job. I mean, we were, it was it like was a, you know, a Mexican, a Nicaraguan, a militant black, and, um, and Puerto Rican, and two white guys from the suburbs. But it was, uh, it was serious. It wasn't like Grateful Daddy or mm -hmm. this or that, you know, it was like, um, our, our biggest challenge when we played concerts in the Bay Area was if we played with Sly and the Family Stone, mm -hmm. then it was like East, West Side Story, you know? Yeah. We were all friends, but yeah. it was like... Knife fight. But yeah. it's all, it was yeah. almost like living the music. Yeah. You wake all, up in the morning, always. have your coffee, mm -hmm. a bite to eat. I miss that. Play. It was very tribal. I miss that. It yeah. sounds wonderful. But still, Crazy. you know, in some ways, in some ways you still have to find time to put yourself in that place if, if you can. I'm going through that right now. Like, uh, you know, you gotta make the space and get rid of the noise and you gotta go there to that place where you gotta, it's really interesting as you grow older, I think, to, to how do you get to that place that, you know, you were so many years ago where uh, you- You know you, what, everybody ages and you develop it with it. You yeah, know? yeah. And um, mm -hmm. I spend time doing music, but a lot of other things come into your life. Yeah, of course. Which is like normal growing yeah. up, but of you course. deal with it. 
Yeah. You know, I've got two kids and now I've got two grandkids. And I love it. Yeah, you know? of course. And Good it's part you. of my life. Of and, course. Um, and then you still got to save time for music, listen to it. And fortunately for me right now, they're always on the phone saying, okay, we're going on tour. And yeah, I know, I know. I, I get to work a lot. So. Yeah, I know. I mean, with best intentions, I wake up and I say, I'm going out to, to the studio. It's not really a studio. It's a, a, a practice room that's soundproofed, and I've got gear out there. I'm going out there, and today is going to be, you know. And then life gets in the way. Sure. And I think... There's no excuse. Mm -hmm. There's a great book called The War of Art by a guy named Stephen Pressfield who... Oh, I love that book. It's amazing. I've given that to like 30 friends of mine. It's sort of like either you do it or you don't. There's yeah. no excuse. Wife, child, this, that, or the other, you know. Yeah. And I'm, I'm hungry to get back to that place. I want to be immersive, mm -hmm. you know. Um, well, because that's the place I love. You know, mm -hmm. so I don't think as you get older you should necessarily give that up. Yeah. I think as you get older, like when I practice, it's more like a meditation. <laughs> so it becomes more. Uh, how can I? I don't even know what the word here. It, um, anyway, please continue. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. No, no, but it becomes more a part of your life. It's it's more uh, inclusive. Or is, is that the word I want to use? I don't know. What 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 is more inclusive? No, not inclusive. <laughs> See, I'm screwing everything up now. That's okay. I interrupted your flow. Well, you're not screwing everything up. <laughs> Drink more. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's yeah. what it is. I, I, I just think... Um, Immersive, maybe? No? Even when I go out, like today I went out before coming down here for an hour, and, and I realized, man, you are not there. You mm. know, you are not there. You, you got some work to do. And, um, Don't we all? Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't want to keep going, well, we all have to work, you know, I mean, it's like, get the fuck to work, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, well. But, but it's, it's a beautiful process. I mean, as I grow older, I, the, even the practice becomes a whole completely different experience than when I was younger. Because I can really look at yeah, it like yeah. a meditation and more zen and go slower mm -hmm. instead of trying to go faster. Mm -hmm. Luckily, today... Um, as you get older and you got that background yeah. of music behind you and what you've done, you get to get up in the morning going, this is what I am and what I do. But you still retain that musician kind of thing yeah. in the back of your mind. Absolutely. It doesn't go, that doesn't go and away. And it's a driving force for the next day and the next day. Yeah. And the next day, but nothing's better than seeing your grandkids and just yeah, of course, you all of over. course, yeah. See, you know, this is this is great, and I think it's for all artists. All artists, I think, should yeah. feel that way. And um, Julie, I think this is a good time to wrap it up. Well, wow, I was wondering if we were over time by now. We are over oh, time, so but you know what? We had a great time, didn't we? Yeah. Tonight, Absolutely. everybody. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank again Michael yeah. Shreve, and we, we actually have your guys' web, websites up here as well. But yes. Michael Shreve and Alan, uh, thank you guys so much for coming. Yeah. Really appreciate you made it. Our, you, you made our night. And it's a pleasure. Uh, yeah, thank I'd like you. to thank our sponsors here Pals Theater and Art Bar, The Stranger, mm -hmm. the folks that came down uh, to support us, and of course, uh, our, uh, on, our live, live streaming. Yes. Audience, thank you We want to thank watching. Dan and John again. Yes. You guys are the greatest. And uh, we'll be back next uh, for next uh, May, first Tuesday on yeah. the 7th. We're going to see you guys then, okay? And one of these days, maybe we'll have you guys, if you're, yeah, if you're love, open to we it. We need a part two. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. This okay. is really good because we're both getting past our bedtimes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, me too. I know. It's time to get that crack yeah. that book open. <laughs> Okay, so we'll plan, we'll plan no, for a Michael and Alan stuff. part two. Crack, crack that Kindle open. Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, thank all right. you all. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.
tune in to Bill Moore After Hours on uh, yes. YouTube. <laughs>